it's definitely influenced by Silicon Valley Company, but with more, I think, of a European uh, design flair. You know, the thing with Silicon Valley companies is they're not producing widgets, you know, they're not producing cars, they're not factories. What they really are are producing ideas and implementing ideas. And what you need in an environment to nurture ideas is much different than what you need in a production environment. You need people to be able to talk to each other, meet each other, collaborate, relax at times. You know, lots of times our, our best ideas come not when we're hunched over our desk or our, our computer trying to do something, it's when we're kicking back and relaxing uh, and chilling out. So what we've tried to build is a very collaborative, innovative environment that encourages people to, uh, to work together and to relax and uh, solve problems. And you've seen that um, although we have a quote um, open floor plan and that there's not a single office including I don't sit in an office and none of my staff do, we also don't have kind of the uh, stereotypical open floor plan, just long rows of desks. Uh, what we've done is to break everything into kind of work pods, work groups, and we have uh, various areas that hold 4, 8, 10, 12 people who are working together on a problem. Uh, and then we have a lot of open areas for them to meet other teams, work with people on other teams. Of course, you know, when people work, they also need to relax. So we've got a lot of relaxation areas. We can go down to the cafe, have a cup of coffee, have breakfast, have lunch, and of course that's all free. We got that idea from Silicon Valley. Um, and then of course, you know, we have a gymnasium because people like to stay healthy. They can chill out in a cinema, play video games. But it's all part of encouraging people to kind of collaborate and uh, work together. Sure, the thing with uh, security and with Avast, it's, it's a very evolutionary business and not really revolutionary. Computer security has been around for, what, 25, 30 years, and the threats keep evolving and thus the solutions keep evolving. If you go back you know, 20 years ago, the big issue was script kitties and big uh, public splashes of viruses that frankly didn't cause any harm. And they all exploited easy to uh, fix uh, flaws in the operating systems and the ecosystems. These days, things are much more, uh, much more complicated. Uh, you don't have big flaws, uh, big loopholes for bad guys to take advantage of. And what it's turned into is a cat and mouse game. You start trying to predict what the bad guys might be trying to take advantage of in the future and closing off those holes. But at the same time, the bad guys are finding other little ways in and you got to kind of um, catch up with it. Um, we think that the thing that's going to be coming fairly important uh, is that we and others have done a very good job of protecting the endpoint, and it's really hard these days to break into the endpoint uh, itself, at least as far as a consumer and SMB endpoint. Uh, which means that they start looking for other ways in, and that way is quite likely going to be things like the home router. Uh, and that home routers tend to be acquired based on, on price, and they have a lot of flaws. We think we can ourselves probably break into about 70% of home routers in the world. They're very poorly protected. Users, if they change the username password on them, change them to something that's easy to, to crack. Many of them, especially in Germany, are also accessible over the internet. And uh, the software tends to be unpatched and uh, have a number of vulnerabilities on it. And it's not that difficult for someone to break in, either remotely um, uh, over the internet via the username and password, or in a drive-by, in which case it's even, even easier. And uh, change the uh, DNS, basically um, uh, change the DNS to their own DNS and capture all the traffic. Uh, that recently happened a few months ago. Anonymous launched a big uh, DDoS attack using compromised home routers. So we think that will be kind of the next big thing. <music>
Sure. I mean, the, uh, the Internet of Things and, of course, the whole 4.0 get a lot of press. And a big part of the reason they get a lot of press is they have nice, catchy buzzwords. I and mean, we also all remember Internet 2.0, but I doubt if any of us can actually define what Internet 2.0 actually was other than the big bu uh, buzz phrase. Uh, but we all know that more and more devices are being connected to, uh, to the Internet. And, you know, we have smart homes. Uh, you know, connected refrigerators, you know, connected thermostats, door locks, security cameras, baby cameras. You know, lots of this stuff has existed. I remember seeing the first internet connected refrigerator like 10 years ago, uh, you know, Samsung in, in Asia. Uh, obviously, they've never uh, really taken off. But when people start looking at what kind of protection is needed, you have to be thinking about what's the risk. If my internet connected refrigerator gets hacked, what happens? I mean, right now, internet connected refrigerators don't do anything. They're just a, uh, you know, a browsing, a browsing tablet. If my thermostat gets hacked, what happens? Well, maybe my flat's too hot or too cold. If my door gets hacked, okay, someone can, uh, can break in. Hacking baby cams has been going on for as long as baby cams have existed. Hacking security cams, the same thing. But the, the common thing with all of this is that none of these devices that are, quote, Internet of Thing really have any direct connection to the Internet. They're all connected once again through the home router. And the vulnerability and the way of protecting them is, frankly, right now, through the home router. Uh, an Internet-connected refrigerator does not have its own Internet connection. It has to connect to a network. Um, some baby cams have their own IP address. Those are easily hacked. But most everything these days, they go through the home router. And if you can harden your home router, as I had uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago, that really goes a long way towards protecting the Internet of Things. Now, the enterprise is a much different story uh, when you get into the BYOD. I mean, we all have mobile device, and uh, for many, many reasons, it's much more convenient to use one mobile device uh, for both your personal and your business. Some businesses uh, encourage it by providing a device. Uh, some sensitive ones uh, prohibit it. But fact of the matter is most everyone is going to be using one mobile device for both. And that causes a risk to the consumer and the business. To the business, it means their data can be compromised. Access to the systems can be compromised. To the, um, uh, to the consumer, if they lose that device, the typical company response is going to be to remotely wipe everything on it, including all their personal stuff, and they have a big data loss. A solution really is to virtualize the entire corporate usage of it and run all the corporate usage on the uh, own corporate servers. Uh, that's why we've brought out a, a new solution this year that does uh, exactly that. Ah, <laughs> uh, so when will AI become a threat to humanity? I remember when I uh, studied uh, computer science, uh, I actually studied AI. And that, you know, that was the big question back then about you know, how far in the future before machines became intelligent and even more so, what's the definition of an intelligent machine? You know, and that ended up being, I think, a, a Marvin Minsky definition that uh, you measured the intelligence of the machine if you could have a conversation with the machine and not realize it was a machine. That milestone has still not been met. There's someone who claimed to have met that milestone a few months ago, but it was kind of a stupid little conversation. So I think most everyone agrees you know, that you know, to meet that Minsky definition of AI, uh, it's not there yet. And you know, I first got into the AI stuff in the, uh, in the late 70s, and you know, this same question has been going around ever since. And of course, it's been a big feature in movies ever since, starting with war games in like 1981, 1982, Terminator movies. And yeah, software decides a, a heck of a lot. Um, you know, dangerous applications, for the most part, have uh, people in the loop. But you know, uh, just look at what happens on uh, on other things. Uh, the Air France crash from Brazil to France. 
Uh, you know, that crash was fundamentally because the computer was flying the airplane. It got into conditions the computers couldn't handle, threw off the autopilot, and unfortunately the pilots on board the airplane had actually never flown an airplane at that altitude by hand without the computers. So I think a bigger risk on things is the computers failing and people having uh, to take over. I think it's apocryphal to be looking at you know, Terminator type stuff or computers ruling the world, etc. Fundamentally because uh, we don't have smart enough machines uh, at this point and we've been working that for 40 or 50 years and we're closer than we were 40 or 50 years ago but I don't see it uh, coming close. Now, I think the other things, though, that you can see are things like self-driving cars, et cetera. Like, um, I have one in the States, um, you know, that's slowly enabling uh, driving modes, uh, Tesla. And um, it's actually rather cool. It's creepy at first uh, to uh, put your trust uh, in the car, that the car is not going to run into someone, it's going to stay in its own lane, going to change lanes properly. But as you start thinking about it, uh, outside of Germany, drivers in the world are horrid. And, um, you know, it's, it, and it, if you can get, a, a, you know, the cars taking care of themselves, it probably actually saves uh, a lot of lives as opposed to harming. Well, I think the question is, are they smarter than every bad guy out there? Because a bad, you know, only one bad guy has to succeed. And uh, I think it's the same story when you go into uh, enterprise. You know, the, the story with a business is, uh, is uh, you either have been hacked or you don't know you've been hacked. Uh, most attacks these days aren't very explicit. The old kind of common sense guidance of not opening attachments to emails, etc., that doesn't really do it anymore. 90% of the attacks these days come from browsing websites, and not dangerous websites such as porn or etc., but just run-of-the-mill ordinary websites that have been infected. And uh, there's no way anyone, no matter how smart they are, can protect themselves against that.